Doug Feith, John Walters, welcome to The Realignment. Happy to be here. Yeah. Good. Thanks for coming. Great to see you. So this episode is a little bonus episode after our season finale in which we're going to talk about Afghanistan. And this really comes after the release of what are co- being called the Afghanistan Papers by the Washington Post. It's a special inspector general for Afghanistan reconstruction report. It was sued for by the Washington Post, several thousand pages. We're not going to dig into the details here, but the broader conclusion of this report, so to speak, was that people who involved in the Afghan conflict were aware that the strategy there was not working and systematically lied to the American people. That is the conclusion. We're going to dig into, with two former administration officials, we have Doug Feith, he was undersecretary for policy during the George W. Bush administration, and we have John Walters, he was the drug czar during the first Bush administration. Realignment listeners are going to remember him from our I think fourth or fifth fourth episode, episode. Fourth episode, Marshall, excellent. If anybody wants to, they should go back and listen to that. But what we're going to focus on here is Afghanistan in particular. So, Doug, I think we want to start with you and really just your admit your experience in the Bush administration, experience on Afghanistan in particular, and then after we let John talk as well on that, let's dig into a little bit uh, on these Afghan papers. Go ahead. Well, as I was the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, mm-hmm. so I was essentially the national security guy for the Secretary of Defense. Um, I came into my job in the middle of July of 2001, and then, of course, it was about six weeks later that 9-11 occurred, and uh, so I was, I was at the Pentagon when, when the, the uh, U.S. war effort began in Afghanistan, and I was there through the summer of 2005 mm-hmm. and uh, helped in the... In the interagency work that launched the the war effort, and then after the Taliban was overthrown, the reconstruction and stabilization effort in Afghanistan. Sure. And John, what's your context, specifically with your job in the Bush administration, but also with the relation to that job to the Afghanistan conflict? Well, what happened is after um, the liberation of Afghanistan by U.S. Uh, uh, forces, um, the effort to... Um, stabilize and rebuild Afghanistan had to deal with the opium problem. Mm -hmm. And while the United States initially did not take the lead, that's something we might want to get into, um, we were involved in giving advice. We had some uh, experience in other countries, mostly in Latin America, and we were working with some of the other allies. So I made a number of trips to work with U.S. development and security forces on the on uh, the institutional and the uh, the strategic issues there. Yeah. So a good first question for the both of you is, from your positions, let's say it's the year 2002, what was your interpretation of why we were in Afghanistan? What was our central objective? Because I think if we look at the way we talk about the Afghan conflict now 18 years later, there's a sort of idea of we came there for bin Laden, but then we got involved in nation building, and then the mission, there was mission creep. How would you characterize the way you were approaching the conflict right when you first started engaging with it? The the main reason that we were in Afghanistan was that the the Taliban government in Afghanistan had made a strategic alliance with Al Qaeda. The Taliban government was challenged by a lot of people in Afghanistan there were it was there was essentially a uh, uh, a civil war going on right. in Afghanistan and the Taliban to shore itself up uh, made a, a pact with the, a group that in Afghanistan was known as the Arabs the al Qaeda people were referred to by the Afghans as the Arabs mm-hmm. and uh, And so you have the Afghan Taliban people who were uh, religiously extreme reaching out to ideological bedmates who were not Afghan, the Arabs, the the Al-Qaeda people. And and the idea was that they were going to help, uh, that the Al-Qaeda people would help the Taliban defeat their Afghan enemies in exchange for safe haven in, and in exchange they got safe haven and the they used that safe haven so that they could 
do the things that they wanted to do outside of Afghanistan. And one of those things was attacking the United States. So the, the whole 9-11 plot was hatched by the al-Qaeda leadership that was taking advantage of the safe haven that had been provided to it by uh, the Taliban government. And President Bush decided after, uh, after 9-11 that he wanted to, f- to, to do everything reasonable around the world to prevent follow-on attacks, uh, other 9-11 type attacks. And he decided to start in Afghanistan by wiping out Al-Qaeda there, denying them safe haven, and, and punishing the Taliban government overthrowing them mm-hmm. because of their role in uh, essentially being an accessory to the plot that that led to the 9-11 let attack. Me, so let me jump in there. So it's an excellent summary there that you've taken us up to that point. Northern Alliance, they come in, Kabul. Now the U.S. is involved. Now you're involved. So what, what does the mission become at that point where the Northern Alliance is taken over? Uh, at that point, and it becomes increasingly clear over the next couple of months that bin Laden is going to be more difficult to find. How do you start thinking about Afghanistan and what to do there with American forces from a reconstruction effort? Because I think that's where the Afghan papers really do kind of come in from the idea, with the criticism, uh, maybe not necessarily of that period, but really later on, that it seems rudderless there about what America was doing. Well, I think that the the goal that the United States had in Afghanistan was to disrupt the international terrorist network Mm -hmm. uh, by expelling, killing the Al-Qaeda people, expelling some of the Al-Qaeda people because we didn't think we were going to be able to reach everybody, um, and making sure that Afghanistan and and getting rid of the Taliban and making sure that Afghanistan would not revert to serve as a base for terrorism in the future. Yeah. We a, a point that a lot of people don't uh, either don't know or don't recall is when we overthrew the Taliban in Afghanistan. We overthrew the government we had fewer than 4,000 U.S. troops in the country. Right. And we were exquisitely conscious of the problems that were created in the past by the the Soviets uh, during the Cold War when they had something like 300,000 men in Afghanistan, wow. and it generated an enormous... Uh, enormous anti-Soviet feeling throughout the country. And even the British in, in, the, in their great game uh, exercises in the, in the 19th right. century in Afghanistan. Uh, and we, we were conscious that if we went into Afghanistan with too heavy a footprint, we would be creating a lot of resistance against uh, hostility to the United States and resistance against our efforts. So... We had a very light footprint. We relied on partnership with Afghans. We, in particular, were in partnership with the, uh, the Northern Alliance, mm-hmm. which was an enemy of the Taliban government. And so when, when the Taliban government got overthrown and we, we then worked with the United Nations uh, process to put in place a, an interim government headed by Karzai, uh, and 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 got that government set up, we were conscious that we didn't want a very large U.S. footprint. We set, I think, modest goals for ourselves, but the main goal was to try to help the new government have enough authority in right. the country and enough resources that it would be able to prevent Afghanistan from being a base for 
uh-huh. attack on the United States in the future. Yeah. So, so that, John, John, that's when yeah. you come into the story, right. basically, correct? Well, yeah, I think there's also some background here that's either been forgotten or distorted by the Post and by mm. a lot of others who have been critics here. One, the liberation of Afghanistan was an amazing strategic success. Mm. A very small number of people with a strategy to win over these desperate groups that had power and were against the Taliban. So minimal loss of life, minimal expenditure of U.S. resources to take out the, the, the that what, as, as Doug said, the center of the attack on the United States on 9-11. Secondly, we wanted to sustain it. Now, at that environment, what people forget here is in that environment, what Afghanistan was was a series of kind of warlords, tribal types who were uh, in some cases, very heavily armed. They had tanks, they had other kinds of equipment from the, the, the Soviet era. And um, we went in and tried to stabilize some of those forces. There was a period of time where, as, as we were simultaneously trying to create uh, a, a cohesive uh, sense of Afghanistan as a country, which didn't exist, and and using uh, meetings like uh, the, the famous Loya Jirga's right. uh, to create a constitution, we were also trying to get these various warlords and their weapons into particular places and contained and to de- disarm them. That was a very tricky thing, and the Afghans were doing this themselves mm. uh, um, with our help. We were obviously providing some military support, but as Doug said, there weren't that many military uh, uh, assets in the country. And in addition, we were trying to create a government that they could sustain at the beginning. Again, this is one of the poorest countries on earth, so we were trying to help them build some institutions, not that are like we come in and we build Cleveland and then try to say take it over without any tax base, without educated infrastructure and other things. We were trying to create um, a a step-by-step process with them, which makes it messy. I think what's completely distorting in the the post-spin on all this is that people thought they were, the people uh, knew what they were doing was a failure or they didn't think about what they were doing. Meeting after meeting was what occurred and U.S. The citizens should be proud of the U.S. officials who sought to not harm people, reduce the loss of life on the part of the Afghans as well as American personnel, mm. and to help them build a country that was theirs. So let me let me push here a little bit, John. So one of the key conclusions of the Washington Post report in the Afghan papers is that, at, you know, from a position that you know well as drugs are, was that opium production in Afghanistan is higher than it's ever been before. It's the number one source for the Taliban income, and that the, much of the government that we've created, these institutions, are elements of a kleptocracy. So what would your pushback be on that? Where, what went wrong with drug policy in Afghanistan such that such a critical fail, uh, part of the mission completely has failed? Well, a couple of things happened. One, I think there was a failure to represent, to, to recognize how important opium was. Mm-hmm. Uh, we spent a lot of money on, I used to say, we spent a lot of money on, on US AID b- trying to build schools and, and infrastructure and other things, in some cases successfully, uh, um, in, in most parts of Afghanistan, I think. But we forgot that the, the kind of development uh, program of, the, of, the, uh, of our enemies was opium. And that opium was a source of corruption. It was a source of po- of wealth for terrorists and others. And, um, um, and but what we had done after we uh, liberated the country is uh, we worked with our allies. And 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 the leader on the um, on the opium side was uh, the UK, and the UN had uh, substantial monies that were brought in on this. So um, and, and it, it turned out after um, a, a period of time. Um, it was clear that they couldn't handle this. But mm. look, look, President Bush, from the beginning, we were working in Colombia, where they'd radically reduced coca cultivation. President Bush, from the beginning, had conversations with Karzai and said, I want to spray. We want to use spray planes to use a herbicide against this. We respected the fact that Karzai did not agree to it, and we didn't spray. Why didn't he agree? Um, well, one, I think he wasn't he wasn't convinced that it was going to be something that he could contain the the consequences of. He was also uh, 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 pushed by the Europeans who believed that the herbicide uh, uh, that we were going to use glyphosate or what's now known as Roundup uh-huh. wasn't safe, even though it's the most widely used herbicide in agriculture in Europe and elsewhere. Uh-huh. So there was a constant environmental uh, 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 battle with uh, some of our own allies about whether or not to use this. But it allows you to, g- to go into areas that are contested that you, you could, we tried manual eradication, we tried um, uh, other kinds of eradication. Now, in some cases, eradication worked. I mm-hmm. mean, we had provinces, when we left in uh, office, 
most of the provinces in Afghanistan were poppy free. And we'd done this through working with people about uh, uh, um, their own governance in their own districts and provinces that, um, that changed the, the way things worked. But uh, it's slower because you don't have forced eradication that you can apply effectively when you say, look, we want you to develop this way. We want you to have a, a, a government that's not based on criminals and terrorists. Um, and we're going to try to help that way. But if you, if you can't do, if you can't take the root cause of the money uh, for some of this out, then uh, it's hard to make progress. But mm -hmm. we worked very hard at trying to do this short of spray and with limited resources and in, with cooperation with the Afghan government that was the representative of the people there. Mm -hmm. What do the two of you say to people who hear the articulation of institution building governance and basically say that's nation building? And nation building is bad. The American people didn't sign up for that. And we see the results of that effort 18 years later with the sort of stalled progress. Yeah. So what, what's the response to that sort of worldview? And, th and that also says, yeah, we, we, we agree we had to go in to deal with bin Laden and al-Qaeda. But after that was done, we should wash our hands effectively. And let me just add this, which is what's the logical end of building a stable nation? I mean, when is it stable? What does stability mean for, for creating a nation? Those are, that, those are different questions. Well, I, no, I think yeah, I, it but really I think is. the nation building stuff is jingoism, yeah. frankly. I okay. mean, it's kind of silly. I mean, mm. uh, July 4th, 1776 was nation building, okay? Pretty good result. Change the world. Change world history. Right. Um, the, the, if the issue is, can you go in as an outside power and tell a bunch of people in another place how to organize themselves and make it work, well, that's a little more difficult. I mean, look, you also did that, frankly, post-war in Germany and Japan. Yeah. So we worked with Colombia, and we changed the face of Colombia. It became a stable place. I was, I was in the U.S. delegation to the inauguration of President Ribe in the summer of two, 20, uh, 2002. Um, the FARC was so powerful in that country, they shelled the inauguration site. At the yeah. time of the inauguration, killed twenty some people on the periphery of the of, of, of the site. Um, and did you see the results of that? Yeah. So I, well, I was yeah. in the legislative assembly <laughs> building when the when the attack happened wow, and wow. these mortars that came on the that came on the site. But they were saying, "We're coming for you," mm -hmm. and he turned the place back. He he took them out. I mean, he reduced their power, and we helped him through through both removing the drug money that was funding that and building up. You know security forces that respected human rights and supported democracy. And we'd been in, that, in Colombia for, uh, for a number of years. So at the same time this was going on, we were changing the face of Colombia with the leadership of a, a courageous Colombian president. So, And, it, well, and in a, a few please. decades yeah. before that, <laughs> there were the, uh, there were the, at least once upon a time, well-known cases of Germany and Japan after World War II. Sure where uh, the United States didn't go to war in World War II in order to democratize either Japan or Germany. Mm -hmm. But once we went to war, and it was clear that we were going to have to get rid of the, of the governments in both Japan and Germany, uh, there was a question of what do we do to, to put some kind of government in place afterward. And uh, and the efforts that were made helped launch Germany and Japan into into very successful countries for and and they remain uh, you know models of of liberal democracy and prosperity to this day uh, in part as a result of the efforts that were made after World War II uh, that you could call nation building. But l let me. Let me say something about the term nation building as a as a curse word. Mm. Um, <laughs> we'll put because it by this, yeah. by this uh, Be podcast. Because this is because this is something that um, was very much on our minds at the time, and I write about this in in the book that I wrote about my time as the Under Secretary of Defense. Uh, the the book is called War and Decision, and I have a quite a, a, a discussion in there about this concept of nation building because George W. Bush in his presidential campaign criticized the Clinton administration mm -hmm. for its nation building efforts. In Yugoslavia, and former Yugoslavia. Yeah, right? Especially in Yugoslavia. And, and Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, uh, with whom I worked very closely, had also criticized nation building and we knew that we were going to be involved in, in a very substantial uh, effort that was 
labeled officially reconstruction and stabilization. Um, but a lot of people would say is nation building. And so we, we asked ourselves, you know, what does this mean? And are we violating what President Bush talked about or, or what Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld had talked about when they criticized uh, the nation building efforts of the Clinton administration? I can tell you that having spent a lot of time talking with Secretary Rumsfeld about this, what he said is that his criticism of nation building is that the, it was about the way the United States went about it in previous eras. He said, Americans have an inclination to go in in areas that are less developed and say almost anything that needs to be done in that area, whether it's in construction or it's in building institutions or uh, designing systems, that we can do it, we can do it better, we can do it more efficiently, and we want to go in and do it. And the can-do attitude that we're going to do it, even though it's in somebody else's country and it's, mm. uh, they have their own culture and they have their own way of doing things, but we're going to come in and we're going to do it you know, the American way, is, first of all, it abrades on local sensitivity and it's kind of high-handed and arrogant, and that's a problem. But it's also a problem that we, we create dependencies. And this was one of Secretary Rumsfeld's big themes. He said, if you look at what happened in, in Bosnia, for example, in the Clinton administration, when, when the peace arrangements in Bosnia were, were made in the mid-90s, the United States was given responsibility for security, military and police kinds of security uh, operations. And we took them over, we performed them, and as a result, the new Bosnian government didn't have to worry about it, didn't invest in it, didn't build up their own security forces so that they could take over. They were delighted to have those responsibilities born by the United States. Mm -hmm. And every time Secretary Rumsfeld said, President Clinton had said, we're only gonna be in Bosnia for a year and here we are, you know, six, seven, eight years later, and he wanted to reduce the American military presence in the country. He was told by all the local experts, if you pull the American forces out, the whole house of cards will collapse. So, and so he well, said- It's remarkable because that's what happened in Afghanistan. I mean, well, ultimately, right? But, but yeah. the, the, uh, yeah. the, the point is, as long as Secretary Rumsfeld was there, mm -hmm. yeah. he was very conscious of the problem of creating dependency. Until 2006 then, correct, in terms right. of the timeline. So, he, yeah. was, he was a Secretary of Defense until 2006. Correct. Okay. Right, and so was there, a, was there a, a departure from that in 2006, from your view? Uh, I th yeah. Yes, I think that, that his focus on that issue, I can't imagine carried yes. forward with the same intensity after he left because he was extremely intense on that subject. Go ahead, John. I think there's a couple points yeah. here. Going back to your question about uh -huh. if you if you're have to do this kind of thing, what's the end state? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's two parts to that. One, there has to be a neutralization of external enemies to destroy a, a country and its people. Um, and if you can't stop those forces, then you can't create a stable country. That's kind of simple-minded, but in these cases, there are external enemies trying to destroy these countries with sure. great power. The second is, um, because we want democracy, stability has to be understood as something that you know, is something in a body politic. There can be a great deal of rambunctiousness, as we know from our own democracy sure. and other democracies around the world. In fact, you know, you can have a police state and it's very stable. But if you want to have, you have to, so you have to provide some institutions and you have to accept a certain amount of, of, uh, of, uh, of movement and, and, and somewhat instability in, mm. a, in, a, in a real popular government where real uh, interests have to conflict. But in the, case of, in the case of Afghanistan too, what you have to remember is I, I was going there, I went there first in, 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 in the end of March 2004. I think the MCI was the first cabinet member to stay overnight in Kabul. Uh, as we went through, I, I made about a couple trips every year. 
um, you could physically see the security situation improve. That um, that th that there were more institutions working. We were building police. We were building the Afghan military. We were getting uh, the, the accustomed to a, a legislative assembly and an executive there that was that was that was securing things. More of the country was coming under security control. What changed there was as we started winning in um, in Iraq. The security situation in Afghanistan changed. Right. And, and, and more, more bad actors started w c c coming in through Pakistan and other places and creating violent acts. And, 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 and we had to change our policy in Afghanistan. Right. We had to put more troops when we had, and we had to be able, we had to be able to sustain it in a way that we hadn't had to after the liberation. We were building, we were building stability internally. So, just yeah. a quick follow up on a theme we had earlier: the discussion of you know post conflict stability and. Um, Colombia, Japan, Germany. This, I think the sort of pushback would be, yeah, those are modern, like not Western in the case of Japan, but they're modernized industrial countries who had, who'd had some semblance of democracy beforehand. Um, Japan in the 20s and 30s had, had democracy. Germany had had a democracy too. Was there not something about Afghanistan that made it different um, in the sense from those other examples? Well, sure. Hmm. I mean, it's what... I, I, first of all, I wouldn't use the term democracy because, I mean, our goal in Afghanistan, I don't think we ever formulated a goal in Afghanistan saying we're trying to we're trying to make Afghanistan into a democracy. Yeah. Wasn't that the Bush freedom agenda, though? Uh, like, no, 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 no. Uh, no, I'm telling you what the goal uh, – Yeah. President Bush sometimes would give high-flown speeches about, like his second inaugural, mm. about, uh, you know, aspirational speeches about democratizing the world – that's fine, but when we talk about what the actual goals for a military operation were sure. in Afghanistan, we never said our goal mm -hmm. is to is to turn Afghanistan into, uh, you know, a Western liberal democracy. We understood that Afghanistan was culturally, uh, it, you know, very different from the United States and and even different from from. Uh, Japan and Germany, and uh -huh. there were going to be special problems of, of institution building there. We did have the idea, though, that whatever we're involved with and putting in place can, cannot be tyrannical, murderous, aggressive, and, and a, uh, an embarrassment to American principles. So, you know, we, we, we were happy to let the Afghans, for example, make important decisions, as John Walter said earlier, through their loya jirga, you know, traditional uh -huh. loya jirga consultative processes that, that, that tribes and that, that yeah. right that wouldn't that wouldn't pass muster as liberal democratic institutions sure. in the West, but were nevertheless, uh, you know, consultative and and humane. That's where they picked Karzai to be their leader. Right. And, well, the, the it, first, it, it, yeah. there was a loya jirga that cooperated with the UN, and that they picked Karzai as the interim. And there was leader. an election. Yeah, and then later, and then presidency. later, there was an election okay. that was uh, along the lines of, right. of you know Western style elections. So we're 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 we have to wrap up here. But I, I I guess the final thing that we should pose here is, the American public has lost faith in the mission in Afghanistan, but the mission continues in Afghanistan. What, in your view, John, does victory look like in that country? And what is the ultimate end goal? What should the ultimate end goal of the United States be? As somebody who was there from the very beginning. Well, I have a somewhat unconventional yeah. view. I mean, the first part is you don't want this used as a base to attack the United States. Now, that does not require us doing transformative, transformative uh, uh, measures on the body politic of Afghanistan. It just means we have to have intelligence and strike capability to go after threats. Sure. Um, it's not easy in a in a hostile environment, but but that would be that would be narrowly speak that would be narrowly speaking. Um, larger, I actually think that the problem in Afghanistan is now we actually have built some infrastructure that's now protecting and stabilizing most of the populated area of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. the cities, and we and the territory that's at, in conflict is mostly the rural areas that's been shrinking. Now, again, I, what I think is if you look at the history of what we did to the Soviets in Afghanistan, when they had they had over a hundred thousand troops there, um, it takes hundreds of millions of dollars to, to, to fight the kind of battle that is now being fought against us and our allies in Afghanistan. This is not about guys 
on the uh, picking up their AK in the in the house and attacking us. This is supported by large amounts of money, large I mean warehouses, truck convoys, and everything else moving weapons and support into these people. That has got to be coming from the countries around Afghanistan. If we don't cut that off, if we don't get places like Pakistan and Iran, maybe China, maybe Russia, I don't know. I don't read the intelligence anymore. Mm. But the fact that we have this kind of view that this is not happening because major rivals of the United States aren't investing a lot of money. Those are targetable. Those convoys, those warehouses, no matter where they are, they're targetable. So um, one of the things, if you look at, you know, Charlie Wilson's war, right. what happened was we built a huge infrastructure to destroy the Soviets. Somewhere that infrastructure, I believe, must exist for the magnitude of the conflict we're seeing now. Now, they're making money off of opium poppy. They're making money off of other kinds of corruption. But the fact of the matter is we have put enough infrastructure in place to be able to help the Afghans themselves move toward greater security absent external attacks on their current status. Got it. Doug? Doug, go ahead. I, the, I guess the one thing that I want to react to is the, uh, the terminology about endless war. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it's on the list here. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, I, I, have, I have a problem with the, the, um, with the term largely because it implies that that Americans or US officials have it within their power to decide whether we're at war or not. Mm -hmm. And I remember very vividly when 9-11 occurred, nobody in the United States thought we were at war. But it turns out that what 9-11 communicated was there were people out there who thought they were at war with us. And so we don't have it within our power to decide unilaterally whether we're at war. Our enemies have a, have a, a voice sure. uh, on that issue. And, and if there are forces in the world, whether they're nation states or not, that are organized enough to be able to conduct a war against the United States, and they are actively at war with us, then we're at war, whether we like it or not. And so we don't have it within our power to simply say, we don't want to fight unless we want to submit to, you know, submit to the attacks that, that, uh, that enemies may be planning. And the, the other thing I would say about, uh, about this idea of, you know, dealing with international threats and then deciding that you're out of patience with having to deal with international threats. It, it, what we have to deal with in the world is somewhat analogous to what we, our law enforcement people have to deal with at home, right? In, in our domestic society, there are people who take things that don't belong to them. Mm -hmm. There are people who rape, there are people who murder, who mm -hmm. try to resolve disputes as it were through violence. And nobody in our domestic debate ever says, you know, it's crazy that we're fighting this endless war against crime. I want it to be over. I mean, when, when can we just say that it's over and, and get rid of the police and we've solved the problem? Everybody understands that it's part of the human condition that there are people who do evil things like murder and rape and robbery and and uh, taking things that don't belong to them and beating up people that they disagree with and the like. And it goes on forever that you have to deal with that. Well, in international affairs, it goes on forever that there are countries that take things that don't belong to them and that resolve disputes by violence and the like. And the idea that we can get to the point where we just decide we don't want to deal with this anymore and we call an end to endless wars and we call an end to having to deal with threats. I don't think it makes any more sense on the world stage than it makes in our domestic affairs. Well, on that note, thank you both so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you.